o'clock. All right, let's get started. I have an enormous amount to cover, so I'm going to be talking kind of fast. But there will be some interactive elements, and I'm going to be asking you questions. Um, so, so listen up, because uh, I'm going to need your responses. All right, hello, everybody. Hey. Hello. Hello. Good, good. A little slow, a little slow. Let's try that one more time. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. Um, all right. You know, I'm, I'm not normally this energetic, but I'm aware of the fact that it's the last session of the conference, and so I feel like I need to inject energy in order to uh, keep you going with me. That's like a, an old uh, faculty trip, right? Where does this thing work? Which button do I press? Yeah, that button. All right. So the name of this session is Cali in 2025, Jetsons, Dystopias, or Zombies, Choosing Our Own Adventure. I, I have no idea what I was thinking when I wrote that description or or did this, um, so uh, um, it'll be interesting to see how this works out. But anyhow, um, so, the, so the concept here is that the Jetsons of the future means that we would and hopefully have a complete collection of high quality teaching materials freely available for law schools and faculty to teach in any model format or for students to, to self-learn, right? And basically that's a Cali heavy Jetson, right? A dystopia, is an incomplete, expensive DRM silos of incompatible materials that promote lock-in and paper use, not reuse and learning. Sort of a, the exact opposite. But don't worry, I'm going to go into this in excruciating detail. <laughs> Zombies are people that don't care or understand that this affects justice and the moral responsibilities of lawyers, the law schools, and the justice system. And I know I'm kind of a wacky, funny guy, or I try to be, um, but, but I'm dead serious about that last one, that what we do in law schools is really important. And it affects the, the justice system, it affects the way citizens deal with their government, and so it's important for us to shoulder that responsibility and be aware of it. And that comes all the way back to a small nonprofit like Cal and, and the work that we do. So in 1994, a little personal stuff first, in 1994 I started with Cal. This is my 25th year. I was a handsome fellow then, <laughs> and uh, we were doing a project with, uh, with, uh, with some Chinese folks, and they called their project East Law, unironically. <laughs> they, they didn't know what West Law was, um, and, uh, and I had a lot more hair, you know, up and down on the face, so uh, that's pretty good. So, you know, 25 years later, here I am. <laughs> kind of scary, the decline, I know. <clears throat> But in 2025, um, I expect it will look, look like this, because um, it'll be another six years from now, I'll be close, either retired or close to retired, I'll be 64, 65, um, you know, and my brain will need to be put in a bottle. So, so that's sort of the, the, the scale here, the arc that we're going to go on with some of this. So back in 1994, the Cali website, Elmer, looked like this, way yes. better than today's. Yeah. <laughs> Look at even look at some of the things we were doing. We were we had a we had the Don Troutman who was a Harvard law professor and uh, one of the founders of Cali, and we named a, a, a Cali lesson writing competition after him. The '96 conference. This is not quite '94, but close enough. It was fantastic. Thanks to everyone who attended, especially those who presented, and our co-sponsor Chicago Kent. Uh, we were uh, partnering with EPA Shadow Law on their CD-ROM. We used an authoring system called Cali Iolis, which we didn't write. Um, and the Cali Student cd provides convenient access to over 100 lessons in 21 subject areas for only $39.95. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, that's our first website. Um, if you scrolled further down, you would also find a link to our Gopher site, which was actually way more active at the time. Um, but that was Cali in 94. Now, Cali in 19... 2019. It's going to look like this. Um, it's, our, it's our new design for the website, but the better version of that is the mobile version because mobile first, right? So a lot cleaner, a lot simpler, you know, a lot more clickable. So between 94, between the time I arrived and the time that I'm standing in front of you today, we've gone from 5 to 11 staff, from 100 to 1,000 lessons, from 120 members to 196 members. Um, with some you know, variations in the number of actual law schools there. Uh, we've done 29 conferences. Uh, we, we publish ebooks, although we were publishing ebooks in 94 using Folio Views. How many remember Folio Views? 
Oh man, you guys are old. Um, <laughs> we've got a war, data J author, quiz right. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Now in 2025, here's where the interactive part comes. What do you guys think? Are there going to be more or less law schools in 2025? Just the six, six years. Less, less, less. Less. How many think more? One. I, I think it depends. And a half. <laughs> <laughs> you must be a lawyer. <laughs> How many lawyers? And what I mean here by more or less lawyers, not people who have graduated from law school, but actively employed as a lawyer. I think there'll be more or less? Oh, a little bit more. Okay, I'm going to say 70-30 on that. What about case books? Will they still exist in the current form, which is to say chunks of dead trees? Or will, will, uh, will e-books or some different thing that replaces the whole idea of delivering course content finally kick in? Same thing. There you are. You will they exist or will they not? What, what, what side are you voting? Trees or I'm assuming it's trees? existing. Same thing, same thing in majority. Majority of case books will still be dead trees. Majority won't be dead trees. All right, some optimists in the room. Thank you. Thank you. What about online education? I just came from the Syracuse session. It was fantastic. All the thought they put into the socialization issue. They worry about how the, how the external students can connect into student organizations. So they have like uh, the ability for all the uh, uh, wine mixers to have uh, a virtual presence <laughs> and stuff like that. So do you think there's going to be, let's, uh, you know, uh, there's obviously going to be more online education, but um, do you think it's going to like pass a tipping point of online education? Let's, 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 let's ask it this way. Will more than 50, no, more than 100 schools be doing at least some form of, of a JD level course? Online. Oh, yeah. oh man. Well, Will all law like, schools be doing at least one online JD oh, course? Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. All right. So lots of, lots of optimism on online education. What about access to justice? Huge problem. All right. Well, will we move the needle on access to justice? I mean, it's really bad. It's 50% of the people who are eligible can't even get in the door on legal aid. 80% by, by some, some great uh, 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 work by Rebecca Sandifer and others say that they, they can't afford or won't go to or don't trust lawyers. You think that needle will, will finally start to move by 2025 or is it pretty hopeless? Needle will move. A couple of optimistic people, hopeless. Is there a middle? 40. All right, good. That, that, that's a good read. Um, and maybe because it's only six years, so you feel like I can, I can, I can, I can guess this out. But let's let's see. So here's my hypothesis: is law schools should protect their core. <laughs> Cali is a mostly successful model of consortia plus tech plus content. And finally, the consortia model has advantages versus for profit such as DRM versus sharing, new biz model experiments made possible, and uh, local, even hyper-local needs being met. So I'm going to spend a lot of the rest of the presentation arcing through this, but with lots of little divergent paths and opportunity for you to uh, talk about this, all right? So first of all, let me explain what I mean by consortia model, because that's, that's like, uh, I, I, I don't know, people might not know exactly what I'm talking about there. First of all, it's not communism, <laughs> right? Which is to say, it's not, let's make everything free, let's just give stuff away, let's make the government pay for it. No, it's just a different economic model, where a group of like-minded institutions or people pool money so that for the benefit of, of the whole, right? Without a profit motive, without this is saying, we got to make as much as possible, we have to maximize on, on sales or something like that, it's all on value back to that community, that consortia of people. That's what reality literally is. We're of and by and for law schools. So the advantages are, of course, um, that when we decide to do something, we, we don't say, well, we've got to make sure that if we, if we give people a case book that we wrote, that we paid somebody to write, that, nope, that they can't make copies of it because then we won't get more downloads or more sales. No, we're just the opposite. It's CC licensed, make as many copies as you want, make changes to it, give it away. So no digital rights management. And it's not so much about the free, the fact that we're going to lower the price of the casebook by the consortia. It's the, it's the freedom, I don't know, it's the free beer versus, uh, what's the, uh, 
What's the other side of that, anyhow? What, free beer? Free beer versus... Free puppy. Free puppy. <laughs> yeah, gift that eats. Um, it's, it's, about, it's about the freedom to not have to ask permission to do something because it's just built in to the, credit, to the, to the uh, Creative Commons license. Um, that allows for new business model experiments. So if a school like Syracuse says, well, we want to do this, but we don't want to have to ship around or make sure there's a, there's a local bookstore that sells the books, instead we can print them up ourselves and ship them, or we can put them online, or we can stick them into some goofy database or website behind passwords. Well, that's all fine, and they don't have, even have to ask permission for that in the first place. And then local or even hyper-local needs. So uh, I'm going to come back to that one. <clears throat> the disadvantages, and this is, this is going to sound a little unfair, I, and I don't apologize for that, um, but uh, you know, I'm going to take strong stands in this in order to elicit emotional responses so that you stay awake. Um, and hopefully there will be an opportunity for you to reply, otherwise, tough shit. Um, so, for-profit models often are the dollar makes a decision, not the customer need. Now that's not always true, right? Uh, companies want to deliver you a product that you want to buy and be happy with. But oftentimes in this new area of innovation and technology, something comes up and says, wow, this would really help the customers, but this is going to cost us money because it's going to lower sales or it's going to prevent sales or it's going to it's going to do something uh, different. And the decision then is, do we do what the customer wants or do we do what the money wants? And they, ha and they have to make the money decision to make the, either the shareholders happy or the owners happy or what they believe to stay in business. And the same thing happens in terms of sharing. You know, they want to lock you into the product so that you buy it again next year and buy it again next year and so on. And I don't deny that Cali wants you to keep coming back. But I want to convince you, or at least uh, with the consortium model, I want, to, I, want to, I want the ideas that we have to have come from you anyhow. So it's not like we're convincing you to come back. It's like you're being convinced by, by, by your needs. So, so, so in some ways, the whole silo model of decision making is already answered by the fact that we are a consortia of law schools. Innovations are evaluated on the above two you know, will this innovation make more money, make more lock-in, you know, give people more educational power or capability? You know, and, um, and this is my most controversial one on this, is that the for-profit market is full of mergers and markets and it's very chaotic. Companies combine and go out of business. Um, there used to be a lot more law school textbook publishers than there were um, uh, back uh, 25 years ago. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll, no, I'll just say it. And, and in the nonprofit world, we tend to like uh, get started and stick around forever. You can't get rid of us. What? How old is ALL? 113 years old or something like that? How old is ALS? Over 100 years old? I mean, we're we're little kids compared to that. With uh, Callie's 37 this year. Actually, June 2nd was our birthday. So just four days ago, I was looking at the incorporation. Paper. So anybody want to fight me on that? That nonprofits are more stable than the than the for-profit or consortia are more stable? <laughs> Nobody? It depends on how well they're run. That's right. It does depend on how well they're running. John. And since I'm running Cali so expertly, <laughs> <laughs> we're in good shape here. All right, so back to our hypothesis. Let's talk about what that word core means. So the core of law school, and again, I'm generalizing here, is to teach the law and teach how to learn the law. In other words, you can't teach all the doctrine, and you know the students are going to go out and run into something that they haven't learned in a casebook or a class, and so they have to know how to approach that and learn it. It's a little meta. Teach how to practice the law. We'll come back to that. Professional identity, that's what the Carnegie Report tells us. Professional responsibility, where do we need that? And social responsibility. I'm putting that in there, and I'll explain it in a second. So teaching the law, the difference here is that teaching in general, not just in law school, but in all higher education, is a lot less push and a lot more pull. And what I mean by that is students don't want to sit there notwithstanding you all sitting there, and, and hear, have someone dump knowledge or dump information into their heads. Right? The idea that you do uh, one hour, two hour, three hour lectures and that's the best way we can learn something is, is, is absolutely been proven to be false. Right? There's a great book called What's the Use of Lectures by Donald Bly 
it was a meta study of over 200 studies of, uh, of the value of lectures, and he basically says they suck. But, you know, and if you gotta do them, then only do them for 10 or 15 minutes and then do something interactive, right? Because you've gotta keep people's attention for longer. But isn't the more important thing is we've gotta teach them how to think? How to Number think two, teach how to learn the law. It's more important than ever because there's so much more law to teach that you're not going to be able to cover everything that they're going to see. And there's so many different possibilities of things that they're going to get into that you can't possibly say in law school that, that, that you can prepare them for every possible uh, area of practice. Um, lately, probably not so lately, teaching how to practice the law has become, uh, is, is on the rise. You know, we need practice ready graduates. I put a rising slash controversial on that because I don't believe all law schools, you know, they might give it lip service, but I don't think they're, they're all giving it um, uh, real, real uh, uh, credence. Um, any, any disagreement on that? No. Yeah. Who's it? So, Let, much less controversial. Sometimes oh. for the wrong reasons, but much less controversial. What, what do you mean by wrong reasons, though? Uh, looks good in the community, uh, burnishes our, the profession's reputation as being a service provider, that kind of stuff, which is all good, but it's not the primary reason for running. <coughs> for running, uh, practice. for creating practice ready graduates, yeah. right. Good. You know, and you're from West Virginia, which does an awesome job and is a fantastic regional school, you know, and so you're the exception to to the generalizations that I might be making here at some point. Uh, professional identity, I'm not going to try to get into that. It, it's complicated. It's vitally important. I read the first 400 pages of the Carnegie Report. I'm not <coughs> sure what they were saying, but I got the general idea that identity creation is a good thing. Uh, professional responsibility, I'm, I'm not going to get into politics, but I will say that, you know, all the stuff that's going on with uh, people uh, not doing good work in government, you know, and we want our system to be trustworthy, and so we wish the lawyers would be stepping up a little bit better and harder on the, on the responsibility side. But that's at, like at a high level. Even at a low level, we all hate corruption or cheating and inefficient judges and courts and systems. Um, and we all hear about them on Twitter and Facebook and everything every day, and we are all outraged constantly about it. Um, and, and so, and, and every time that goes by, I think, you know, why didn't the judge do something smarter there? You know, why didn't the, why didn't the lawyer fix that? You know, I don't get it. You know, I thought that's what their jobs were, was to make those things work better. And finally, social responsibility, and I'm going to pound on that, acts as the justice issue, is that that's a failure of the entire profession, from legal education all the way through the bar associations and each and every individual lawyer, that we aren't doing enough for the 50% of the people who are eligible for legal aid and for the 80% of the population that can't afford or thinks poorly of us, not just the lawyers, but of everybody involved in the profession, we are effed if we don't fix that. There are, active, there are active companies and money and situations that are trying to route around us as blockage to that problem. We could be out of business in a, in a couple of decades. I swear to God, I believe that to be true. Just like the travel agents, just like the journalists, just like lots of other people who have been dis in disintermediated by some form of technology plus a different business model. I think we're the taxi drivers and Uber is coming for us. All right? Oh, calm down, John. Jeez. <laughs> Anyone want to fight me in that one? No? All right. Cool. So let's talk about Cali. Yay! Happy! Cali is a mostly successful model of consortia. I'm not going to get into that mostly part, but I put it in there as a qualifier because I've spent 25 years with lawyers. <laughs> 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 so Cali is a whole bunch of things. I couldn't even list them all. Uh, well, of course, our lessons, there's a thousand of them. They're written by law faculty. They're reviewed by law faculty. I hope that means high quality. Um, it's the highest quality we can get. They've, run, they've been run well over 10 million times. They're organized by topic, and so there's good granularity in that. That's really important as the, as the amount of your content goes up. You've got to be able to find it in smaller and smaller pieces. Um, it's good. It's not complete. A thousand is a good start. We probably need two or three thousand by the time we're done in terms of coverage. Um, and we have a lot of really good tooling. 
we're really good at tooling. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pound on that one a lot. You know, we have a brand new authoring system coming out this summer called Cali Author Web. Uh, we stink at naming software. Um, <laughs> you know, this thing should be called something like, you know, Zanzibar. Ooh, Zanzibar. <laughs> now I'm thinking more like Thanos, snap, and half your problems are gone. <laughs> <laughs> But if you want to get one part of it right, you're, you're getting the right part right. But spoiler, right? Sorry, I should say spoiler. Uh, we have a, a new lesson viewer from last year that's been running now for a full semester. A full semester? That's right. It, was, it went full time in January. And as far as we know, uh, no one died. No one died. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's working good. This is the better version of it because mobile first, right? Uh, we've got a, a, essentially a dashboard or a, or a service called Lesson Link where faculty can create links in the lessons and then they can spy on their students' scores. Otherwise, the students can run the lessons without anybody spying on them. And the value of that is they get analytics. So the faculty can use Cali Lessons as formative assessment right now. This has been around for a few years. Five, now. Sam, five years? Sam ran out of here. He knew I would point him out. Um, yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a few years, but we've, but we've really made it, I think, into something powerful fairly recently. The analytics will tell you by question how the students did, by student how well they did, by lesson in aggregate, and you can download the whole thing as a spreadsheet if you want. Um, lesson Live, I didn't have one with the new viewer, I gotta, I gotta get that. Lesson Live is you can run the lesson in the classroom and as the students answer it, the faculty member can see the score. So it's like a clicker that's been glued onto uh, a tally lesson inside the classroom. Again, formative assessment. It's kind of cool. Uh, whoops, quiz right, which is sort of like all of that, but a lot, a lot simpler and a lot faster. So just multiple choice questions, but all the same formats underneath. All the plumbing is the same, so that it runs on the same ecosystem. All right. So formative assessment is a, is a muscle that faculty, you know, are kind of weak at, to be honest, right? The too many years of 14 weeks and one final exam, you know, and so they're on a learning curve and, uh, you know, the, as a result, the tool's got to be open and they got to be flexible for whatever situations that they're in, which is my subtle hint at saying, you know, not proprietary, not paper user sort of a situation because they're, they, they, they need the flexibility in that way. We also publish case books. I pay faculty to write case books and then we give them away. We've got more than a couple of dozen. They're written by law faculty, they're reviewed by law faculty, they've been downloaded 100,000 plus times, they're CC licensed, you know, and, and uh, not as impressive in our lesson space, but we're trying really hard as our tooling on that. You know, we've been playing with Pressbooks, which is a WordPress plugin, and Elmer has, has been doing some wonderful work in that space. But it's really hard to, to make self-publishing easy because case books are big and hard for people to write. And you can't, you, you can only go so far to make things easy for them, but they still have to do the hard work to make it work. Oh, there, I forgot I had a press book slide there. We're also, uh, Rebus, which is the uh, foundation that Hugh McGuire, who wrote press books, is working on a really cool project called Rebus Inc. It's a, it's a reader for scholars that allows you to gather all the things you're reading and annotate and um, I, I, I like the idea of it. It's a, it's a scholar's workbench. I think there was actually a tool like that about 25 years ago. Just um, thoughts about a tool like that. Yeah, no, no, I've actually, I, I remember like, a, like a, an installable, it was a download and install, but, but it's, a, it's a web space and I think it might be the future of how this goes. Uh, Kindle doesn't do it because it's not an open, uh, it's not an open space. Um, and, uh, um, and, and so, you know, I've been, I've been talking to him and, and we've given him some money in the past to support his, uh, because this is an open source piece of software. I really like some of the ideas where that's going. Um, but the tooling in that space really owes it all to Dev and to Elmer, who, um, who, who in, in, in this case, it's the procedure or the process. I mean, getting out a, a 900 page book, um, uh, has uh, so many steps in it for quality control and for making sure everything's working. How many steps were in that spreadsheet? I, I narrowed it down to 150. 150 <laughs> steps. 
Um, some, you know, and, and what I'd love to do is automate that. Even though I'm not a robot, I would like my staff to be robots sometimes, or I'd like some of those things to be automated so that they're so that we can scale them and they're consistent. Um, and, and but that's where our, our experience in tooling comes from. We're adding another uh, body into the uh, chipper there. That's uh, Sarah Smith. <laughs> Sarah, are you here? There she is. Sarah's just started this Tuesday for Cali. <laughs> Stole her from the ABA, sorry. Um, <laughs> and so I hope to, you know, uh, not just, uh, now that we have two people doing content, I expect there to be four times as much productivity out of that, right? Because <laughs> it's a multiplier, right? Yeah. It's not, a, not an additive thing. Right, I figured we'd double the bottleneck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll talk. Okay. Uh, A to J Author is a, is, a, is a tool that we started building over 15 years ago for automating court forms, Legal Aid Zoom. I probably will get a cease and desist notice for that. Right, now, um, now, right, now they'll take down the YouTube video. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, it, the, 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 the thing that I realized recently about A to J Author is that it has inspired a whole bunch of other people to do exactly the same thing. And so they're not, there are now a half a dozen, maybe even more, uh, competitors, both open source and commercial and legal tech startups, all doing automated court forms or automated decision trees. Um, and I swear to God, they, are, they were all inspired by us. I know in some cases they were inspired because they were in an audience that I was speaking to. And I'm like, this is great. But for whatever reason, they wanted to go their own paths, which is perfectly fine. Again, because I don't have to make money or maximize it, I'm happy that there's a whole bunch of people now working on this problem space. Now, as an engineer, I'd like them all to like, you know, settle on one piece of software, but you, know, you, you take what you can get as you go, right? There's been uh, over a thousand forms or processes that have been automated. It's been run over five million times and almost three million documents generated. Uh, Jessica, what did you calculate that was worth in lawyer time if a lawyer had done those? One billion dollars. A billion dollars worth of lawyer time. Two million invested, it's returned a billion dollars of legal services. Wow. Damn, if I could spend that. With real math, <laughs> not lawyer math that did that. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> me? I've worked with over 20 law schools who have taught it as a course, uh, either, either where the students actually wrote ADJ got interviews, or we just did a demo, or it was part of a group project, or something like that, and we're ramping that up as much as we can. Our tooling on that is very robust. We have uh, ADJ.org, our own hosted platform. Anyone working on an SRL facing project, anybody not know what SRL means? Self representing litigant, and it's completely free. Uh, we want this to be used by anybody who, who needs to. Clinics, for course projects, for ADJ clubs, for hackathons, that would be awesome, right? The ecosystem sort of looks like this. You, you author at a2jauthor.org. You publish to LHI, our wonderful partners who are in the legal aid space, or to a2j.org, which is our own hosting situation. And then the SRLs come to either one of those, uh, you know, and, and that's where the code gets executed. Whoopsie daisy. The whole thing is going open source. So you can either have the code to change or play with yourselves, or, and this is more of a meta, we're trying to figure out how to open source the website as a platform or as a white label or as a package. And that's Tobias's work. So that if you don't want to like, I don't want to mess with how authoring or how forms get automated, but I want to, but I want to do stuff with what comes out of that process or what goes into that process. So I want to stick A to J in as a component to my case management system, my court filing system or something like that. You know, so we're, we're having to think, play four dimensional chess on, on, how, on what parts of this can, and where the cleave lines are for, for doing something like that. My people on that are Jessica and Tobias and Batovi. Mitch, Mike Mitchell is here from Batovi. Thanks. Hey. You know, who are, are very able consultants. Um, you know, maybe, the, maybe uh, one of the few times in my life I hired a consultant and didn't regret it. <laughs> 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 oh, Mike and Batovi are awesome. I have to point out that uh, just this fall, uh, spring, they, they, the, the team went to a hackathon at uh, Suffolk and won the grand prize. And by the way, I didn't expect that money. Yeah. <laughs> so was I. <laughs> Even awards, which was, uh, it, it, it's not silly, but it was a, it was a, it was a little bit of a, a, of a fun project when uh, the, the, the Amdur Award <coughs> got canceled back in 90 or 95, and we picked it up. 
you know, is something that we've been now doing for almost 20 years. Over 300,000 awards, 130 law schools, but my favorite is that Cali is now a verb, right? You know, to Cali a class means to get the highest grade. You know, am I unhappy that we're associated with the smartest students in law schools? No. <laughs> Even there, we're working on tooling. We've got a consultant in Media Current, and we're, because we're starting to think that maybe there's more that can be done with just the simple idea of awards, right? Oops, I don't have that in there. Um, I'll, come back, I'll come back on that one. <clears throat> Kelly Count, of course, is our conference. It's uh, the 29th <coughs> one. We visited 17 different schools. There's over 1,300 sessions. Not all of them are on YouTube, but a bunch of them, uh, most of them are. Um, and, and back to that identity creation thing, um, it's, it's very much a place where technoids who normally don't get to speak because they're not a librarian or they're not a law professor so they can't speak at those, get to stand up and talk in front of the community. And, and matter of fact, or, or, or when, when I started this, that was one of my thoughts for the conference was, you know, these people are terrible speakers. We've got to give them some place to practice. <laughs> and so the Cali conference was, was, a, was an opportunity for a lot of them. Um, my favorite story there is Mitch Davis. Mitch Davis, yeah, who, who's, who was at Oregon, went to UNLV, went to Stanford. Now he's the CIO at Bowdoin. Um, but man, the first time I had to twist his arm to give a talk, and he says, I'm really bad. And I'm like, oh, but dude, you've done this really cool project. And he was up there, and it was uh, Albert Brooks in Broadcast News, you know, sheet sweat coming off, <laughs> you know, and he was kind of stuttering. And I, you know, I encouraged him to do it again, and he did, he got better, you know, and, and now he's like the CIO at Bowdoin making a lot more than I am. You know? <laughs> um, but it, it, it's, it's a place also where we can mix communities. How many of you are law faculty? How many of you are law librarians? Keep those hands up, how many of you? How many of you are none of, the, none of those two? Wow, see? It's a place to mix those three communities, um, you know, and hopefully learn from each other. And it's the only conference that tactically, intentionally says that. That's the goal. And of course, we hope it's fun. Right? I mean, I know I do these goofy <laughs> things. I wear these uh, silly outfits and stuff like that. But I'm, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to send a message. That this is that we shouldn't take ourselves too seriously. That this can be a fun thing to do, you know. And uh, and I try to match it to the theme as much as I can. So, so back to my hypothesis. Is, what was I on? Oh yeah, the consortia is both you know tech content and fun. Because community is if community is just all us getting along and doing stuff together. It's I, I gotta I gotta have more fun than that. I gotta have a reason to get up in the morning and, and go to work. So. So fun to me is a vital, important thing. But it made me think. Somebody made a, 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 I don't know if this conference or another one, somebody talked to me about, yeah, I really like the Cali vibe. And I never, I, 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 do we have a vibe? Yes. 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 Yeah. Awesome. What is it? Yeah. Or should I not query this? Because, <laughs> because sometimes when you examine something, it, you know, it becomes less powerful. It, what, what is it? For me, I gotta say that, sorry Loyola, um, for the last four years I've been trying to get out of legal education for one reason or another. Coming to Cali, I get hope again and I stay. <laughs> that's why I come to Cali. Whoa, that's marvelous. Anybody else want to comment on the vibe? I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm not trying to be interactive here. I'm genuinely curious what your what your. I think the I think the Cali vibe had to do with the free T-shirts that we didn't get this year. <laughs> 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 oh, 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 the freedom to say things like that <laughs> in, in, in session. Cool, cool. Um, you know, I want to say that it's intentional, and it, and it is. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I do want us to be welcoming and open. Um, uh, doing the, the, the code of conduct, when, when, we had a, when we didn't have a code of conduct for years, and we finally got one last year or the year before, to me it was a little bit like, you know, doesn't everybody already get this? You know, um, and I had to come around to like, no, you got to be explicit. You got to make sure people really know that. And I totally get that now. 
but, but my goal was always that we were welcoming and inclusive and fun and, and interactive and stuff like that. Um, so anyhow, so let's talk about the consortium model <coughs> advantages. First of all, the DRM sharing versus iteration and openness. Legal ed is a small market, right? We're not higher ed, we're not law or law practice, you know. We're, uh, you know, less than 200 schools now. You know, maybe a couple of billion dollars if there's money, if you're talking about the size of the money. And every law school kind of does the same thing, you know. They all lead to a JD with all sorts of variations, you know. And uh, when, you're, when you're not big enough, to attract a sufficient amount of vendors or, or things for competition in the market the, to, to, uh, to innovate. And you're too small, you know, and we're not too small, there's enough money for a Cali to exist in other nonprofits, you know, then that sharing makes us all stronger. It's a, it, to me, it's a no brainer, but I'm steeped in this stuff because of my 25 years with Cali. And I think if it, once you're aware of that, you have a duty. Once you become aware, that that's a good idea, you, you, then you have to follow through to find out if that's the, bre the best and, and brightest and smartest way to do things. So, so to me, that's what the consortium model gets you. The new biz models, legal ed is more than just lawyers. A lot of people that graduate don't <coughs> practice law. They do other things. They go into business. They start businesses. Legal ed is more than law schools. Right? There's a lot of law schooling and learning of the law that's not happening in law schools, which might be a missed opportunity, you know, or it might be a dropped responsibility. Depends on, on, on the situation there. Um, you know, because of my work with X as the with A to J author, I've learned that everyone is a lawyer, right? I can go represent myself. So that means I'm a lawyer for myself only. I'm a, probably a bad one. <laughs> You know, and what's the joke? Uh, a man who, who is his own lawyer has a fool for a client. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, it's an enormous amount of that happening. Um, and, and if everyone is a lawyer, I should have like waited to pause on that dramatically, then everyone is a law student. Now think about that, law schools. If everyone's a law student, are you missing an opportunity or are you dropping the responsibility there? Kind of both. So the consortium model might help with that. And of course, local, even hyper-local needs. Do y'all remember, did y'all see, um, I can't remember his name, but the guy who talked on hyper-local at uh, UNLV. How many were there? Anybody, was, anybody remember there? Just one? Yeah. He came out, he lined up three Red Bulls and started talking. <laughs> he oh, was yeah. faster. Oh, he was a sports cat, or he was a sports runner yeah. of local uh, and then he went to work for uh, Kansas, right, for the yeah. uh, Kansas right. State Journal or something like that. I can't if remember his name. But man, he was man, he was hyper. <laughs> yeah, he, 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 was, he was my idol. <laughs> so the hyper local, and, and what I got to say about that is that you know um, um, I'll, I'll use my one swear word. God damn it, U.S. News is wrong. They rank us by some weird set of numbers that they don't tell us exactly how it is. They kind of leak out that information. And in my opinion, it's wrong, 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 wrong. You know, we're more than that ranking, and we suffer terribly by it. Dean's getting fired, Dean's getting hired, just because of the ranking going up or down three or four points or something like that. We're law schools that are in, that, that have to deal with our nation's laws, our state's laws, and our city laws, and uh, depending on who and what we are, we're, we're focusing at different levels. We're about geographies. I mentioned West Virginia being a fantastic regional school. I hope that wasn't a diss. No. Um, you know, and schools that are like national schools or things like that. And we're populations, right? We're having, I was just having a wonderful conversation with uh, Jim Rigos here about the fact that it's really hard now for schools to find qualified uh, diversity candidates, uh, minorities, or people from low socioeconomic uh, um, uh, families or, or uh, uh, income, you know, to go to law school because the, de the deck was stacked against them long before they went and did a poor job on the LSAT. And we can't get them into law school because we know low LSATs and low GPAs are going to result in low bar passage rates. And the EPA just said you got to get your bar passage rates up. And so there's, you know, all sorts of weird pressures going on in every direction on that. We're in trouble. So Cali, 2025, what is it going to look like? Well, I hope it's going to look something like this. 
that everything that's taught in law school is going to have, well, almost everything, notice I didn't merge the two, <laughs> is going to have a Cali lesson covering it, you know. The ones that don't, okay, it's areas that are moving too fast, even our publishing cycle takes a few months, you know, or it's uh, rare, old, weird stuff. I leave it to your imagination to figure out what that means. Um, the, the, the yellow part on the other side would be things that are not law, meta topics uh, that are law school, non-law but law related. And I think that area by 2025 is going to start expanding. Actually, there's already uh, a project that I'll talk about in a second, and there's pressure all over the place to do things on tech competence. Um, I, I heard about, I, I attended a session on legal analytics yesterday. Um, legal tech sessions all over the place. I've got a website with 50 syllabi of uh, teaching tech to law students courses. Um, and of course the fact that the law is not just about the United States, it's going, it's going international. Um, well, maybe not for the next two years, but after that <laughs> we'll start going international again. <laughs> and, and, and boy things are going to get complicated. <laughs> I'm sorry, I interrupted somebody. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> not going to say it. Once again, I toss Sarah in there into the, into the wood chipper to say that's what I hope that by 2025 we'll have 2,000 lessons. You know? We have a fellowship that just started. Uh, it's called the Law School Study Skills Bar Exam Prep. I don't know if the Bar Exam Prep is actually part of the title, but it might as well be. Um, in which we've uh, uh, contracted with seven people from the Academic Success, Academic Support, the Aspers. It's okay, they call themselves that. Uh, uh, community, uh, here, here are the folks from Loyola, CUNY, Syracuse, CUNY, Hofstra, CUNY, St. John's, CUNY, and o Oklahoma, and CUNY. <laughs> <laughs> no, it just seems that way. We got, we got a couple of people from CUNY. We were only looking for five. We, uh, we interviewed a bunch, and these seven just stuck out. They were so excited and interested, and they seemed to get our vibe. And so we said, we'll expand this to seven and do this. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have 25 or 30. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, lessons that cover things like study skills and um, dealing with your mental health. And actually, I don't even know what the subject outline looks like because that's going to be their first job is to write that outline and then decide what lessons, what tutorials need to be created. We're doing this uh, with some of our own money, but mostly with money for that we got a grant from Access Lex, which is awesome. And so, you know, I want to do a great job at this and get more money from Access Lex. <clears throat> we, of course, in 2025 hope to have more books, but I'm glad you're here, Steve. <laughs> the book is dead, <laughs> isn't it? How many people think the case book is dead? How many people wish the case book? Okay, how many people wish the case book were dead? Oh, even better. Even better. It's not dead, I know, I know, I know. But but it but it it, it sure needs to it, it needs it needs some innovation or something like that. And what do I mean by that? I mean that people are teaching not off of their books as much, they're teaching off of their LMS, or they're teaching through Twitter or some social media, or they're injecting those parts into it. Or GitHub is a model where they upload the materials and, they, and there's diffs or, or, or uh, what's, what's the word? Um, branches. Um, branches, right, or forks of, of the book. Uh, that's the H2O model from Harvard. Um, personal learning environments. I was just talking about Rebus and their Inc. project. That's where the student pulls the whole LMS into their own environment. And that's where it exists. And, and then they go out on forays to find information. Or it's just a damn app. <laughs> you know, is there an inflection point by 2025? I think yes. It, you know, I think it's already passed, and we just haven't, you know, finished hearing the, the boom strike us yet. At least I hope so. Right now, um, you know, it looks like a bunch of un undifferentiated M and M's, but you know, we want to organize this into smaller pieces that are by chapter or even by things, so that we can feed into those, like an API or like a. Uh, like, a, like, like Lego blocks. That would be my ideal world in 2025. For Cali Awards, I meant to come back to this, we have 300,000 smart law students in our database, um, you know, and I think they all have a story to tell. How did you get the highest grade in that class? Who would be interested in hearing that story? All the rest of the students who take that, that faculty member's class. You know, and so I feel like, oh my gosh, I've let that go by without minding it or doing something with it. And again, not to mine it for money, 
if I were Google or Facebook or something, but to mine it for the benefit back to the students. Because if students are getting the highest grade, they're doing something right, and that's, that should be like a knowledge base that we can gather and build on, even if it's just getting a story out of that. Um, the other way we can think about this is the wards could expand into something like the micro-credentialing system, certificates, skills, hackathon projects, student portfolios. I don't know. We, I, I'm, I'm thinking that. I don't have actual plans on that, but this is 2025. I'm sure Elmer will get to it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> For A to J, um, I could give an entire talk on this, but I'm going to condense it down to this, that um, decision trees in the law are go way beyond just filling out forms. You could think of teaching students how to think about systematically understanding statutes or writing persuasive arguments um, uh, or, or writing papers as, as, a, as a flow charted sort of thing. And if we could put an interface on it, because we're already doing that in the, in the form space. This is not a perfect fit, I know, but, but I, so I've only got sort of a vague ideas of this. You know, I, that's where I'm hoping that we can take A to J, at least in our thinking. I've had lots of fantastic conversations with uh, Deb Cohen and uh, Jane Wynn on our board of directors. Is Deb here? No. I thought she was. No. Okay. Deb is here. So. Deb Cohen. No, in this room. <laughs> yeah, Deb Cohen is in this room. He's yeah. Oh, there you are. So, you're waving too slow, and I'm, I'm moving too fast. <laughs> that's unusual. <laughs> I'm going too slow. I know, I know. <laughs> So, you know, because uh, we, we've often said that if you, if you have to write a flow chart that walks a pro se through a legal process, you better understand the law behind that yourself. And so automating forms is a, it requires the student to understand the law. That's, I mean, that's, a, that's another hypothesis, but it seems to be true, right? So we, we're, we're, we're essentially trying to create these expert systems that, uh, uh, that, that do more than just uh, a legal process, but also sort of a meta-legal process of, of the statutory analysis and such. And what about the conference? We've done 29 of these. God, aren't you bored of these things? No. No. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take the win and move on. <laughs> so those are my hypotheses. What about Cali in 2025? Well, <laughs> 25 is only six years away. If you want that, if you want all that awesome, cool stuff to happen in just six short years, it's going to cost money because I have to hire more Sarahs. And Sarah, are you, Sarah, are you working for free? Unfortunately, <laughs> um, and that means raising dues. And so now, now I'm the ugly guy talking to the consortia, saying, you know, if you want us to do more than what we're doing, and you're excited by what we're doing. Then when, we, then when we say, well, here's what we're going to do by raising the dues a little bit, um, you know, don't argue with us too much. I know you got to grumble and stuff like that. Um, but that's just a fact, right? Anybody want to fight me? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> what? what? Give us heads up. Yeah, waste like 10%. Like, like put it in your budget, factor it in. You just raise the dues, and then we have to go scamming for money. You just of course, we'll give you a heads up. <laughs> Where was the last time we raised the dues, John? Actually, uh, eight. This is the so this year is the longest we've gone without a dues raise. Eight years. Next year it'll be nine. Wait, seven. Eight, something like that. Um, so that that long, right? And um, and and we we get away with it, I think, because. We're really smart on technology tooling. You know, we use a lot of open source stuff. We're really smart on partnerships. Um, and yes, we will absolutely. Actually, consider this your heads up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in 1994, he had that handsome devil. In 2019, he lost his mind. And in 2025, he's just going to be a brain in a bucket. <laughs> Robot. And that's all I got to say about this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Everybody wants to get surprised. Is Elmer going to keep his brain on his desk? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's where he keeps his own brain. <laughs> All right, let's go down and finish this conference with the raffle. <laughs> Yeah.
the fourth few That's right. <laughs> Like what lessons do you to run like the last 30 days? And every school has, you said you able to see what the student authorization code is. Uh, there's also a dashboard. I think Teresa wants to read some kind of comments. And the dashboard shows you how to put aside lessons and last year. The total number of one bills the last year. And then some registration stuff. And we're going to be expanding that. Exactly um, going forward, so yeah, and then that's the case. The 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then yeah. that, and that obviously, yeah. up here, it's like I'm gonna fly. Yeah. And, and list it, list it as University of Arkansas Standard Configuration. Mm -hmm. Same in both. <laughs> <laughs> 